for torch singer Kim Basinger in The Marrying Man. Jet setters Andy McDowell and John Malkovich go broke in The Object of Beauty. And Robert Townsend forms a singing group called The Five Heartbeats. It's all coming up next on Siskel and Ebert. falls for nightclub singer Kim Basinger again and again and again in The Marrying Man, a romantic comedy that's one of five new films we'll be reviewing this week. I'm Siskel and Ebert. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is an affectionate throwback to those zany comedies of Hollywood's golden age where two people fall in love and discover they can't live with each other and they can't live without each other. Movies like this depend almost entirely on the chemistry, if any, between the stars. And the stars this time are Kim Basinger and Alec Baldwin, who have a lot of chemistry. Baldwin plays a millionaire playboy who's engaged to the daughter of a Hollywood mogul. His buddies take him on a bachelor trip to Las Vegas, and right there in a sleazy gin mill outside of town, he falls instantly in love. Birds do it, bees do it. Even educated fleas do it, let's do it, let's fall in love. It turns out that Kim Basinger already has a boyfriend, the mobster Bugsy Siegel, but she and Baldwin can't keep their hands off one another, and that leads to trouble later that night. Oh, my God. Um, oh, this is bad. Well, well. This is so bad. I couldn't see much, but it didn't sound good. Another man who's very angry with Baldwin is Robert Loggia as the mogul whose daughter Baldwin has left standing at the altar. They were kidnapped and forced to get married at gunpoint. At gunpoint? What is that? A new crime wave? They grab people on the street and make them get married? After Baldwin and Basinger's first marriage ends in disaster, the buddies make the mistake of going back to Vegas again. I wonder where she is now. And that leads to another marriage. This is the happiest day of my life. I always love these days, too, Johnny. I really do. Hey, hey. Yay. The screenplay for The Marrying Man was written by Neil Simon, who once heard of a couple that had been married four times and knew that there had to be a comedy there somewhere. The result is one of Simon's best comedies in a long time. In fact, after Biloxi Blues, it's a comeback. The movie is not a polished masterpiece of comic perfection, but it has a lot of juice and energy, high spirits, and exaggerated romance. And by the end, you almost feel sorry for these two exhausted lovers who have nearly self-destructed under the pressure of their relentless passion. Well, here's a case where we completely disagree. I felt there was absolutely no chemistry between Basinger and Baldwin, and of course, they're well known as an off-screen couple as well as on-screen, so it really, I was mystified. The moment comes, uh, you know, the first scene that you showed when uh, he sees her instantly and we're supposed to accept that they are in love, and it didn't, uh, they didn't wow me. I thought that uh, neither character was very well written, that there was, there was nothing actually for her to do. Um, I compared her with the performance of Michelle Pfeiffer in The Fabulous Baker Boys, kind of similar stories, but uh, not nearly as well written and not nearly as well performed. She wasn't, she didn't seem to be anybody to go crazy for. Well, maybe the problem then is that it's not the chemistry between them, but the chemistry between each of us and the screen, because uh, yes. I picked up chemistry and you didn't. That's undebatable. I, I mean, I, I can't convince you you're wrong. I understand. You can't convince me I'm wrong. Yeah. I thought that they did work together, that there were sparks, and that also there was a kind of a comic energy that was coming along in this movie about people who are just practically destroyed by this love that they have for one another that they cannot deal with. And I'm sitting there not feeling anything between them, and as a result, it seems like a very mechanical plot where, you know, they're in love, out of love, in love, out of love, and the supporting cast of all those movie cronies in the background, mm -hmm. I thought those guys were really annoying. Okay. 
Our next film is called Career Opportunities, and this one caught me by surprise. It's John Hughes's latest script since Home Alone, and this one could be called Working Alone, a surprisingly touching comedy about an older adolescent young man who has a lousy home life. He hates his parents. They don't particularly like him. He's known as the town liar. He can't hold a job, as his siblings are only too eager to point out. You got canned again? Well, he didn't get canned. You got fired. His last-ditch job is working as the night janitor in a department store where he's left alone. He goes nuts until he spots an unexpected visitor in the store who fell asleep there while shoplifting. That's Frank Whaley as the young man, Jennifer Connelly as the young woman, and soon they are hiding out in a dressing room from burglars who have broken into the store. You're on top. Did you want to be on top? Oh, no. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm just fine right where I am. Now, what I like about the film has nothing to do with those scenes. Rather, it has to do with the two original characters presented here, the young man who has low self-esteem but a stable family and the young woman who has no rapport with her parents but all the self-esteem in the world. Together, they find a common ground of respect during this one enchanted night. Career Opportunities is not a great movie. It ends much too abruptly. But I like these characters, and I think they stand for a lot of troubled young people. To me, this movie was completely negligible. It was long at 80 minutes. The characters were absolutely without any interest at all, and that includes Jennifer Connelly, who was very beautiful to look at, yeah. and who was very good in that Dennis Hopper movie earlier last year. Frank Whaley, who was kind of a Eddie Bracken look-alike and kind of plays an Eddie Bracken character, seemed totally inexplicable in this film. I didn't understand where his personality was coming from, and every single thing that happens is completely manipulated, all about the, the burglars turning up, the cop and the father looking for the girl, the people who arrive and leave from the store and so forth. I just sat there in stunned disbelief at how completely lacking in any inspiration or interest this movie was from beginning to end. Well, let me tell you about the character that this Frank Whaley plays, because I thought that was kind of, I think, I'll, I'll tell you what I think he's about, and I think he's about what a lot of young kids are about. And that is, obviously, his parents uh, and he are in conflict. That happens a lot in, in adolescence. Um, but the kid feels, he's called a town liar. I mean, he feels like he's dirt. And here comes this, uh, this, this is the last person in the world. Uh, he danced with her for five seconds one time when they were forced to switch partners in a dancing class in school, and this was a high moment for him. Suddenly, they're trapped alone. They, can, oh, they only are the ones that they can rely on, each other. And... Uh, he becomes well, a man. Gee, you described the plot, but yeah. I don't think anybody is going to go to this movie in order to get a nice little moral lesson about how the Not town uh, a moron suddenly gets a chance to go out with a pretty girl. I mean, this movie is apparently being sold as a comedy. It's not funny. Mm. It's being sold as a romance. It's not sexy. It's it. being sold as a thriller. It's not thrilling. Mm. There's nothing to recommend it except the fact that you learned a little lesson about human nature, you think, no, from no, this guy. No, I, I didn't learn a lesson. What I did is I saw two characters grow up during the course of the film. I mean, I knew the lesson before I walked in. Uh, but it's the same kind of story that you see in American Graffiti with a nerdy guy and a bombshell girl. It's a, it's a classic teenage <sighs> to, story, to and I like it. To use the words American Graffiti in the same sentence with career opportunities mm -hmm. is, to me, utterly astonishing. Later in the show, John Malkovich and Annie McDowell are broken in love and the object of beauty. And coming up next, the five heartbeats about the rise and fall of a rhythm and blues singing group. That's the amateur night performance that launches a career for the five heartbeats in a new musical about the rise of a singing group that's made up of five very different members. The movie was directed and co-written by Robert Townsend, who made a lot of waves with his debut film, Hollywood Shuffle, a few years ago. That was a send-up of Hollywood's favorite cliches about black actors. Now Townsend gets the chance to star in a role that is not as cliched as Duck, who is too shy to ask a girl out on a date. Can't dance. Don't know how to talk to women. It's a virgin. Look at that dumb little look on his face. The Heartbeats get some dance tips from an old hoofer played by show business veteran Harold Nicholas. One of the movie scene stealers is 12-year-old Tressa Thomas as Duck's little sister with a big voice. Some 
Five Heartbeats tells the story of that singing group over a period of some 30 years as they hit the top and then when Eddie, their lead singer, hits the skids. There is really too much story here for one movie, too many characters, too many years, and so there are some gaps in the narrative, but the energy in the film is joyous, the acting is strong, and after a slow start, I found I was really caring about these characters. And we continue our split view throughout the show because uh, this picture didn't touch me. I mean, I like films about uh, musical acts getting together. Mm -hmm. I think a better film like this with involving young women from about uh, 18 years ago is a film called Sparkle, which I thought was a really special mm -hmm. film. And I think if people are interested in this kind of picture, that would be one that they should rent. Here, um, I felt that the, the, all the storylines were kind of predictable. I mean, you got the one on drugs and uh, the one, actually the one that I did like was the kid who gets involved in the church. I thought mm -hmm. that was, a, a, may not be original, but at least it was freshly done. Um, the rest of it, I just saw where, you know, every, the crisis, uh, triumph, um, and really, wide swing so that it, it seemed a, a kind of a mechanical story to me. Um, the music's good, but that's off of a soundtrack. I liked, uh, you see, when the movie started, I didn't know who all the characters were for about 20 minutes. There was very erratic editing, and I mm -hmm. thought, this movie just doesn't know where it's going. And then somehow, so that I had some of the same objections you had, but somehow as the movie got along, then I, I found out what the relationships were, and I began to care. I found that there were little scenes for each character in which that person was faced with a problem in his life and had to solve it, both for himself and in terms of the group, or not solve it. The whole story about Eddie, the lead singer, and what happens to him, I didn't think was cliched. Uh, and even if it was, it's based on, actually, on some real life stories that Townsend used, so that you can't I, really claim it's cliché okay. if it's I think if that, it has a I think you put fact. your finger on it when you said that there are too many stories in too many years. Um, frankly, Spike Lee, I think, did a better job with another musical group in Mo Better Blues, where at least we saw some, some richness of the character. This thing is just too, too, just too much. Well, I liked it. Coming up next, The Object of Beauty with John Malkovich and Annie McDowell in big trouble as they come close to losing their bankroll in Europe. Please don't talk about liquidating me. What I call what, Greg? What's been coming between us? That's John Malkovich and Andy McDowell as a yuppie couple in London living off their credit cards in The Object of Beauty, a strangely appealing drama about a pair of most unlikable layabouts living the high life in a London hotel room until they start running out of money, and Malkovich suggests to McDowell that she sell her valuable little Henry Moore sculpture. McDowell has a better idea, a larcenous one at that. She suggests hiding the sculpture, claiming that it was stolen, and getting the insurance money to help pay their debts. Well, it is against the law. I hate to break it to you. Of course, prison is one way of cutting down our hotel bills. Before they can put that plan into effect, the sculpture is stolen for real. Now, completely without assets, Malkovich contemplates his own suicide and his obituary. Best known for his wit, wardrobe, and business acumen, Bartholomew died penniless and in an untimely death without a watch in an overpriced London hotel room which he could not afford. Malkovich is terrific playing a louse. The other key player in the story is the hotel maid, a deaf mute played by Rudy Davies, who was suspected by the hotel manager of swiping the statue. So, Mr. Doctor, I think perhaps the most sensible thing to do would be to search wherever it is that Jenny lives. Now, what happens in the story is that Malkovich and McDowell are brought closer together by this event, by the theft, forced to scramble for some money. They are forced to focus on each other, and their tentative surface relationships needed that crisis to affect some bonding. And I was very surprised that I stayed with these mostly unlikable characters. Andy McDowell is not at her best here acting. She isn't very convincing, expressing anger. But John Malkovich is excellent and was becoming his signature role, the smug jerk who secretly, and he really does this very well, who secretly loathes himself. He seems very confident, but you really know that he doesn't like himself. And this is a fresh script written and directed by Michael Lindsay Hogg, I guess worked on Brideshead Revisited. It's a good film. I liked it a whole lot. What I liked about it was the fact that at the very same time, it was a character study of the personalities of all the people involved, the couple, the maid, right. her brother, the hotel manager, yes. the security guy, each one has a different and peculiar personality. Yes. And at the same time, it's a little bit of a thriller in which you trace this uh, valuable object that it goes from hand to hand yeah. and almost gets lost and gets found again. It disappears, it reappears, so that there's a lot of ingenuity in the construction of the screenplay. And at the same time, 
a lot of subtlety in the characterization. Often those two things don't go together. Well, you make a real good point about those side characters. Mm -hmm. And when you say the word screenplay, you know, we have been knocking American movie scripts now for, for the last few years. They seem to really have deteriorated in quality. Somebody really wrote specific characters mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you're, I forgot about the brother of the, of the uh, maid. Mm -hmm. That's a real good punk character. Mm -hmm. And not written punk fly off and be flashy like it might happen in an American film, yeah. but the, the kid's got a problem there, and it, it, it's, it's, he's fascinating. This is a really good writing. Well, you know, if you took the story of this screenplay and described it, you could see how it could really be turned into a crummy would-be comedy, in yeah. which this couple doesn't have any money, and then the sculpture is stolen, and then it turns right. up again, and then it disappears again, and the people are running around the hotel, and there's all the... The fact is that the dialogue here, the timing, the way the scenes are handled, make it into a good movie, and so you're right, it's the writing, it's the writing it really that is. makes it something special. When we come back, Daddy Nostalgia, with Dirk Bogart's first performance in a decade as a man who gets ready to die. I think of the past. And I burst out laughing. It's by Dirk Bogart, a very good actor, is a British salesman who's married to a French woman and now, at the end of his life, has little to say to her. But after he has serious heart surgery, their daughter, played by Jane Birkin, comes to stay with him at their home in southern France. And this is almost the first time in her life that she and her father have really talked to one another. When you've gone, I shall have no one to talk to. <laughs> oh, except the old women here. You've got mommy? Mm. I sometimes wonder if we ever had anything to talk about. The dialogue in this movie is especially well written, and there's poetry in moments like this one, where Bogart frankly considers his approaching death. I'm not ready to leave the party. And I'm, I'm very irritated when I think life is going to stop suddenly, and more irritated to realize it'll go on without me. I don't care for that at all. We have a great talent for life, you and I. Don't waste it. Daddy Nostalgia was directed by one of the best directors around right now, Bertrand Tavernier, who also made Round Midnight. It was written by his former wife, Colo Tavernier O'Hagan, about the death of her own father. So this is sort of an autobiographical film about saying goodbye. Dirk Bogart is perhaps the best actor Tavernier could have possibly chosen for this role, where he projects not only resignation, but also intelligence, regret, and humor. What touched me was that the father and daughter did get the chance to say goodbye. What touched me even more was that the husband and wife were never quite able to cross the barrier between them. And that, I think, is really the greatness of this picture because, again, I think they're normally, when you make a movie like this, the tendency is to wrap everything up neatly. Mm -hmm. And so that the husband and wife have at least one scene of mutual respect and, and then there's hope in yeah, some way, yeah, you know, yeah. that he'll live on in their memory. No, this picture is written hard, but is also very tender. With the, the relationship between the, uh, the father and the daughter is beautiful. And why can't we live with both things? Why can't we live with a man who has no rapport with his wife at long last and who reaches one with his daughter? It's a beautifully sculpted Once story. Once again, you're talking about screenplay. Now, yes. I, as I was watching this movie, I remembered a picture with Jack Lemmon called Dad, which I didn't like right. very much. And right. that was and a I... movie in which everybody had to be lined up and checked off in terms of their big scene of reconciliation and with truth that. and tears. And the fact is, in real life, there are some people you make your accommodation with, and there are some people you don't. Some relationships cannot be That's repaired, right. and this movie is about both kinds of things. It's a terrific, terrific film. Coming up next, our home video pick of the week, one of the best gangster films of recent years. And that's saying a lot because there are so many to choose from. Two of the more interesting filmmakers around now are a couple of New Yorkers, Joel and Ethan Cohn, who have made three fine films in a row, the thriller Blood Simple, the comedy Raising Arizona, and the gangster melodrama Miller's Crossing, which is just out now on home video. In case you missed it last year, this involved a convoluted story of Irish, Italian, and Jewish mobsters double-dealing each other for love and money with young Turk Gabriel Byrne sleeping with his boss's girlfriend and trying to convince his boss, played by Albert Finney, to stop protecting her brother, a slippery bookmaker. Gabriel Byrne is ostensibly the hero of this story, but like everyone else in this crazy power game, he is deeply flawed, and it's exciting to find such a character at the center of a movie, especially one as stylishly directed as Miller's Crossing. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. A split vote on The Marrying Man with Kim Basinger and Alec Baldwin. Roger found them appealing together. I thought their characters were lame.
Another split vote on career opportunities, with John Hughes repeating his home alone formula with an adolescent couple this time. To great success, I thought, Roger thought the movie was a total loss. Another split vote on the five heartbeats. Roger eventually got into the characters. I thought there were too many cornball situations. But we joined in agreement in praising the object of beauty. Two thumbs up for Andy McDowell and John Malkovich. And two thumbs up for Daddy Nostalgia. A touching, without being sappy, story of saying goodbye to a dying father and a husband. And we'd both like to see more of Dirk Bogart. He's such a superior actor. That's a wonderful movie. The Object of Beauty was really a surprising movie. Came yeah. out of nowhere in terms of its intelligence. And I also liked uh, The Five Heartbeats. And I'm going to stick up for career opportunities because of those two characters that I thought were sharply drawn. Okay, that's your privilege. That's it for this week. Next week we'll be back with a new edition of one of our favorite formats, Buried Treasures, where we each pick movies we think have been unfairly overlooked and are now available on home video. This is a new show. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Admiral Cruises presents their seven-night Caribbean vacation sampler cruise on the Azure Seas. Days and nights filled with everything from sampling the islands to relaxing on board. Whenever you cruise, cruise Admiral Cruises. Just a minute. That's all it takes to cover gray with New Age. New Age by Fanciful, the leader in temporary hair color. New Age. rice a the San Francisco treat. Now with 30 flavors, you can serve it every day for a month and never serve the same dish twice. Ringer Lawn Restore is the natural chemical-free way to make your lawn healthy and green. Ringer. All natural, all good, all safe.